What are the four principles of relative dating? The relative dating method, it helps the geologist figure out the relative order in which the geologic events occurred. Now, importantly, this method has nothing to say about the geological age of the rocks, but it can help the geologist figure out which rocks are the youngest and which are the oldest. The relative dating method has four very basic principles. The principle of original horizontality, the principle of lateral continuity, the principle of superposition, the principle of cross-cutting relationships. So let's dig in and take a look at the principle of original horizontality first. Have you ever looked at a road cut and seen tilted or bent layers of rock? Well, the principle of original horizontality states that all rock layers were originally horizontal with respect to the Earth's surface when they were laid down and were only later bent or tilted. There are some exceptions to this principle, but generally this principle works for most of the Earth's rock layers. Second is the principle of lateral continuity. If you have been to the Grand Canyon, you may have noticed that many of the rock layers appear to have been cut off. In geologic lingo, they call this truncation. Essentially, the Colorado River has eroded out a canyon that now separates a layer of rock that was at one time connected. Well, that makes perfect sense when you can see both sides of the canyon. But what happens when you find truncated rocks without a matching set somewhere else? Should we assume that these truncated rocks were actually deposited exactly like this? The answer is no, and that's because we know through observation that rock layers always pinch out to a feather edge and eventually disappear. So when we see truncated rock layers without an accompanying set somewhere else, the principle of lateral continuity says that these layers must have originally pinched out to nothing but were later truncated. Then there is the principle of superposition. This principle simply states that the Earth's oldest rocks are always at the bottom. So when you see a really thick sequence of rock layers, the principle says that the one on the bottom is the oldest and the one at the top is the youngest. Once again, there are some exceptions to this principle, which we'll look at shortly. But from a big picture perspective, this principle works for most of the Earth's rock layers. Principle of cross-cutting relationships is the one that trips most people up. This principle states that a geologic feature that cuts across or deforms another geologic feature must be the youngest of the two geologic features. So, for example, these igneous rocks were once molten magma, which then crystallized. These crystallized rocks are called a batholith and so represent a single geologic structure. At a later time, some molten material cracked the crystallized material and was injected into the crack. This geologic structure is called a dike. Since the dike cuts across the batholith, we know that emplacement and crystallization of the batholith occurred first, and that the dike was intruded into the batholith at some time later. Yep, it's that simple. Okay, so let's now try and put all four principles to work to see if we can figure out the relative geologic history recorded in this diagram. This is the underground view for a series of geologic rock structures numbered 1 through 12. Keep in mind that bent rock and erosion surfaces like this are also geologic structures. Based on what we've learned, can you figure out the relative sequence of events? And do you know what principle to use for each choice? If you don't want to hear the answer just yet, then put the video on pause because here they come. Okay, so if you had number three down first, then great job. This indeed is the first geologic event and this accords with principle C. However, you'll notice that this layer is bent. Yet according to principle A, this layer was originally horizontal which means that at some later time it was deformed into its present shape. Just keep that in the back of your mind going forward. The next geologic event was the deposition of number four, 
followed by numbers 7, 9, and 1. You'll notice that layers 7, 9, and 1 look as though they've been eroded down and cut through. We call this surface of erosion an unconformity. And indeed, based on principle B, we know some kind of erosion must have occurred. We know, for example, that the edge of 9 over here is truncated and that the layer does not thin out and disappear. This means that it extended out farther than it does now. That it did at one time join with the layer over here would be a good hypothesis based on principle B. But what happened and when did the erosion occur? Well, although layers 3, 4, 7, 9 and 1 are now all bent, we know that at one time they must have been horizontal. It's possible that some tectonic event pushed on the layers from one end, or maybe pushed from underneath, causing them to warp, producing a geologic feature called an anticline. An anticline is rock bent in the shape of an arch. Since the unconformity cuts across the top of the anticline, we know that the warping or bending must have occurred first. This warping or bending would therefore be the next geologic event, which is number 8, on our diagram. Of course, the next geologic event is the erosion, but what caused it? Was it the deposition of number 10, or did it occur beforehand with number 10 being deposited on top of the erosion surface at some stage later? Well, we just don't know. So to be cautious, we give the erosion its own number, which is number 11. Number 10 is next, but what is after 10? Is it 2? Well, look at number 6. This is a magma body that has intruded into the rock. But when did this occur? Well, notice that 6 is connected to a dike, and notice that the dike is cut off at the top. It's a good bet that layer 2 was responsible for cutting the top from the dike. This means that 6, our magma body and its dike, were emplaced after the rocks had bent and after the surface was eroded down. From here, it's pretty straightforward with the deposition of 2, 12, and then 5. So how did you do? This is the order that you should have got. 3, 4, 7, 9, 1, 8, 11, 10, 6, 2, 12, and 5. Okay, it's time now for our spotlight on creationism. Uh, did you know that some young Earth creationists are denying the validity of the four principles that we've just looked at based on Walter's law, where sediments of one depositional environment come to lie on top of another, but more specifically, on the work of creationist scientist Guy Berthold. Back in the 80s and 90s, Berthold performed a number of flume experiments that clearly contradicted some of the four principles of relative dating. Berthold demonstrated that when sediment particles of all different shapes and sizes were subject to varying flow conditions, the mixture of sediment particles mechanically sorted themselves out according to size and density. These sorted particles produced horizontal layers just like we see at the Grand Canyon. Importantly, these horizontal layers were not created one atop the other like placing one layer of cake on another. The layers were created from the left to the right as water and sediment flowed downstream. These data are fascinating because it shows, for example, that the law of superposition does not always prove true. Notice that this layer, although on top, is older than this bottom layer which is deposited at a later time. So what should other young earth creationists like you and me make of this truly fascinating research? Was the whole fossil record deposited in a sideways fashion all at once during Noah's flood? Well, I think that the answer is almost certainly no. It is true, Bertholdt's findings are worthy of more research, but there are major hurdles to young earth creationists who want to apply these data to the entire fossil record. Consider dinosaur footprints that in this paper are described from four separate horizons spanning about 600 feet of rock, or these clutches of dinosaur eggs that were also found on four separate horizons. Since these sediments are hundreds of feet thick, and since Bertholdt's hypothesis suggests that all fossil-bearing rocks in any one location were deposited at about the same time, then this would mean that dinosaurs were laying eggs 
and walking around hundreds of feet underwater while these topmost layers were being deposited. Remember, all of this has to be occurring underwater at about the same time. Now, some might object and state, for example, that this package of strata was deposited at or near the surface in a sideways fashion, as Bertholdt's hypothesis suggests. This would give dinosaurs some time to walk around and lay eggs. Then, at a later time, another package was deposited in the same way over the first package, again giving dinosaurs time to roam around before the third and fourth occurrence. And you know what? I've got absolutely no problem with that hypothesis. In fact, given fluctuating water depths during the flood and multiple week-long stretches of time, when the Earth's surface emerged from the floodwaters, I think something like this actually occurred. But do you see the problem? If that is the case, then we are back to validating the principle of superposition. That is, this layer is older than this one. And problems like this abound for creationists that champion this idea. Bertolt's findings are certainly interesting, and I think young Earth creationists can apply some of his research to creation-based model building. But it would be misleading for young Earth creationists to apply these data to the entire fossil record. The geologic and fossil record is just far too complex to simplistically attribute to any one process, especially one that heavily relies on extremely small-scale flume experiments where the parameters for sediment type, flow direction, and flow velocity have all been set within very narrow limits. A global flood such as that envisioned by young Earth creationists must have included an incalculable number of very, very complex processes that simply can't be distilled down to a single process. So that's all from me, Ken Colson here at Creation Geology for Beginners. Look, if you enjoyed this video in any way, then please go ahead and pound that like button, subscribe, and ring the bell. You'll find a link in the description if you would like to give. And as always, I appreciate prayer. Thank you and goodbye.